day today? Did you get some chance to rest today? Good, I hope so. I was looking at the rain. I love the rain. But I like the rain when I'm at home with thick socks, a book, and a nice cup of tea. It's always the best. Well, guys, tonight I'm going to go straight into our topic because last night I left you at a, at a, at a cliffhanger, right? I'm sorry about that. We ran out of time. But uh, we're going to pick up where we left off, and tonight we're going to get even deeper, a little deeper. Isn't the Word of God exciting? You know, you're learning so much, and, and I hope that the main thing that you're learning is how much Jesus loves you how much he wants you to know what his plans are, what's coming ahead. Because ultimately, yesterday um, we were sitting at a table with a few people having a conversation, and I told them, I don't know how you picture heaven, but I picture heaven like all astir right now, like a military camp, just doing everything possible to bring this whole mess to an end because heaven is longing for us to come home. So I'm like, thank you, Jesus. All right, well, let's start with our, our um, theme motto here. Let's grab our Bibles. This is uh, the exercise part of our program. We at least lift our arms up, all right? And let's repeat it together. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. Amen. (laughs) So now let's sing our theme song. New rise upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Your eyes upon Jesus Look full in his wonderful face And the things of earth will grow strangely dim In the light of his glory and grace Amen. Let's pray. Loving Father in heaven, Lord, we're so grateful that we can come back out tonight, that we can open your word, Father, and we wouldn't dare open your word without inviting the Holy Spirit to illuminate our minds, to teach us. Father, as we've been coming out, um, Lord, and learning new things, it's just so clear to us, Lord, the details that we can find in the Bible that we can walk in the light and not in the darkness of this world. So bless each one of us now as we go over part two, the time of the end. And I pray again, Lord, that when we leave, we'll leave excited about what you're doing in the heavenly sanctuary in our behalf. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 All right, so we're doing the time of the end, part two. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to begin by reviewing a little bit of last night's presentation, okay? And, and the reason for that is because the material that we reviewed last night is so important and so foundational that actually half of tonight's prof, um, presentation is a review of yesterday, okay? And why is that? So that what you learned yesterday can become more clearer, and then what you missed yesterday, you can catch today. Are you with me? Now, is repetition important? Yeah, I mean, it's clear that Jesus was a master teacher, and he repeated over and over again, because how quickly do we get it the first time? Not quickly, and if we're not drinking enough water, like Lisa said, right? (laughs) It may take us four or five times, but no rush. We'll stick it out until we get it. All right, so let me share two new principles with you before we continue on our presentation. Now, I want to bring you back to your elementary school days and begin with a math lesson, all right? How many here enjoyed math when they were in school? 
<laughs> put my hands behind my back. All right, so I'm going to take this nice and slow for us tonight, all right? So let's pretend for a moment that this is a this series of numbers. It's a number line. And actually, Pastor Andy is a teacher at the academy, so he'll help me out if I mess up here. All right, do you remember the number line? How many remember the number line? Raise your hand. Well, a couple. Remember how you told your teacher, hey, I'll never use that in my entire life. Well, here it is. <laughs> For the first, you're going to use it tonight. All right, so all the numbers on your left, they're the negative numbers, okay? And then all the n uh, numbers on your right, they're the positive numbers. And the little line in the middle, let's, let's consider that the zero. You with me so far? So let's do a math problem. What is negative 2 plus 3? What is negative 2 plus 3? What's the answer? Wow, you guys are good. Okay, that's a pretty easy problem, right? All right, now let's pretend that this isn't a number line, but it's a timeline, right? And we're now going to go from um, all the numbers on the left of the goal line, right, are the years before Christ, and then all the numbers on the right in the, of the goal line are the years after Christ, all right? So now let's do the same problem, <laughs> But this time, we're calculating years instead of numbers, right? If we begin in the year 2 BC and we move three years into the future, where do we land? What, where do we land? One. Some say one. One. Some say two. Okay. How many think the answer is one? All right. So there's a few. All right. That's a pretty good answer, except that with years you have to calculate just a little differently. And the reason is that there is actually, um, to, um, the answer is actually 2 AD. That's the answer. Are you with me? Most of, I can see there's teachers here. They're going, yeah, that's right. Because there was no year zero, okay? So the answer is to, when we're doing with the timeline, there was between AD and BC, there was no zero. So you move three years down the line and skipping zero because, again, it didn't exist. So it's 2 AD. All right. Does that make sense to everybody? <laughs> All right, good. Whew, I got through that math. If it doesn't, just remember this, right? If you, if you didn't, just remember this, that when you calculate years from B.C. to A.D., just add a number. Just add one, right, and, um, and that, so that you can get the, the zero. Okay, so let me give you one more principle, all right? In Bible prophecy, a day, you forgot to remind me to put my glasses on. <laughs> okay, in Bible prophecy, a day, okay, represents a year, all right? And, and so quite often when you see a day in Bible prophecy, that represents a year. For example, when Jesus tells the church of Samara, Samaria in the book of Revelation that they're going to suffer for 10 days persecution in Revelation chapter 2, he's actually telling them that they're going to suffer persecution for 10 years, right, under the emperor Diocletian. And we talked about that at some point. This is fairly prominent feature in Bible prophecy, and you see it in many different places. Another example is when the people of Judah has sinned for 40 years, right? And God told the prophet Ezekiel to show them how long they were, were sinning and, having, and had him publicly um, lie on one side for 40 days. And look what it says. Ezekiel 4, 6 says, I have laid on you a day for a year. So does that make sense? So a day in Bible prophecy most of the time equals a year. So, all right, so now you have two new principles. Number one, when you're doing a timeline from AD, BC to AD, how many, how many, um, what do you add? One. All right, and in prophecy, in Bible prophecy, when it speaks of a day, it's normally speaking about? Okay, very good. You pass. Now, let's pick off where we left off last night then. <laughs> All right, so last night we studied Daniel chapter 8, right? And we discovered that it's a parallel to Daniel chapter 2. So Daniel chapter 8 and Daniel chapter 2 are parallels. So we, we, we quickly review Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So you already know the head of gold is Babylon, the chest and arm of silver are Persia, the belly and thighs are Greece, the legs are Rome, and the, divided, the ten toes are the divided um, Rome. Okay, so we got that that far. 
right? And then the, we know that the toes, again, are the fragment country of, of Europe, right? Are those. All right, we good. Now, then we turn to Daniel chapter 8, where we have most of the same kingdoms, but different what? Different symbols. There was a ram that had two uneven horns, which represented who? Right, and if you remember, we know for, for sure because how do we know that that for sure, that ram was Media Persia? How do we know? Do you remember? Gabriel, Gabriel told us. There you go. Gabriel told us. So this was one of the easiest ones that we had to undo, right? Then we saw the goat and the big one notable horn, which symbolized what? What did that, that the goat's big long horn, what did that represent? Okay. It represented who? The king, um, uh, what king? Alexander the Great. Very good. And then the horn broke off, and then what happened? It was replaced by what? Four horns. Very good. And what do those four horns represent? The four generals that wind up taking over Greece, right? And then from that four horn, what happened? What came up? A little horn, right? right, came up from that, and we went through that quickly, but that little horn represented Rome, right, in its united phase in the legs, and it's in its divided phase, the ten toes. Are you following me so far? All right, good. So it kind of covers the same ground as the legs and the feet of the statue. So we have a ram, a goat, and a little horn in, in Daniel chapter 8. And then there was one more part. Does anyone remember in Daniel chapter 8 that one part that was new? Remember the principle of repeat and expand. It wasn't there in Daniel chapter 2, but now in Daniel chapter 8 there was something new. Do you remember what it was? Do you remember? After, after we, hear, we see the, 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 the ram and the goat and the little horn, remember then, then there was a prophecy regarding the 2,300 days. I knew you remember, I knew. All right, so look what it says. And he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed, right? So this part of the pro prophecy was completely different. We had not covered that yet, right? And there were no animals. There wasn't any horns. There were no conquests, right? It was just a prophetic time. So question, um, and, there, and, and this was the only part of the prophecy, right, that Gabriel, did he explain this part of the prophecy? Right? It was the only part of the prophecy that Gabriel didn't give us an explanation, right? For everything else, Gabriel had a lot of details. With the ram, we know what it was. It was Persia. We know the goat, what it was. We know what the little horn was. Those three parts, there's a lot of explanation on it. But the 2300 days, Gabriel simply says what? Do you remember? Exactly. He said, listen, Judge, uh, um, it's true. Um, just, it, it's, it's going to happen in many days in the future, Daniel, so don't worry about it, okay? And so did Daniel, um, did Daniel say okay? No, he was upset. He was trying to understand it. He's like, wait a minute. Um, it, he got so upset that he got sick because he knows that it's important, but he couldn't understand it, right? So does that mean that you and I can't understand it? If Daniel couldn't understand it, does that mean that you and I can't understand this 22,300 days? You know, we can understand it, right? All that we have to do is we have to look for the clues. And remember, sometimes we have to read the whole thing in order to get the clues. And how do we know that it's important, that 2,300-day prophecy? How do we know? Because it's in the Bible. So if it's in the Bible, it must be important. All right. So look what Daniel 8.17 says. So the angel Gabriel comes back and he says, Understand, son of man, that the vision refers to the time of the end. And remember we talked about if it refers to the time of the end, who especially should understand these prophecies? Us, because we believe that we're living in the time of the end, right? So this refers to that. So that's one clue. Let's look at another one. For at the appointed time, the end shall be. So we discover that this 2,300 day refers to an appointed time in history. And then we discover that Paul describes a last day event right, that is appointed, okay, and the event has to do with what? With the judgment, okay, so let's see what Acts 17, 31 says, he has appointed a day 
on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. So then we looked at the prophecy itself and saw that in 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So we went on to the rest of the Bible looking for more information regarding what the cleansing of the sanctuary means. Do you remember what the cleansing of the sanctuary? When a Hebrew heard that word, what did immediately come to their mind? It had to do something with what? <laughs> It has to do with the sanctuary and with judgment, right? That was another phrase. Okay. So, and he goes on, and, and so there's three clues. Let me give you the three clues quickly. It was a prophecy that dealt with the end of time. It was a prophecy that had an appointed time. It was already on the prophetic calendar. I like that phrase. It's on the prophetic calendar. Like you have your calendar with dates, what you're going to do. This was already on there. It has something to do with the cleansing of the sanctuary. When you look at the evidence, when you look at the theme of the judgment comes up again and again in, in the Bible. And there's no doubt that God is pointing us to the Old Testament sanctuary in order for us to understand this. The judgment, which proves to be one of the most important keys for unlocking the book of Revelation. Did you hear what I said? Understanding the sanctuary is one of the most important keys that you need in order to understand the book of Revelation. All right, so let's look at there. There is no question that the language of Daniel chapter 8 is sanctuary language, okay? Now, not only does it mention the sanctuary, it also uses clean animals to describe the Persians and the Greeks, a ram and a goat. So those were considered clean animals. Both of the animals were actually used in the sanctuary service. In other prophecies, you have unclean animals, like a bear and a leper, but these were clean animals. But this prophecy, again, uses the clean animals. It's another piece of evidence putting us towards the sanctuary. Plus, you'll notice that Daniel chapter 8 actually talks about sacrifices. We didn't see that in Daniel chapter 2, and it mentions the sanctuary several times when you look at Daniel chapter 8. So last night, we took a tour also of the Old Testament sanctuary, remember? All right, and again, all of this is still review that's setting us up. So in the outer court of the can, can, of the the sanctuary, we have the, the altar of burnt offerings, right? And where sinners would bring a sacrificial, sacrificial animal, they would symbolically confess their sins over the, 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 the animal, and then they would sacrifice the animal. And of course, that lamb pointed to who? To Jesus, because Jesus was the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. And then we also have the, la the laver, right? A large wash basin, right? And, the, and where the priests would do what? They would clean themselves, right, before they went inside the tabernacle in the presence of God. So this represents what? The cleansing of our sins, right? Because we need to be cleansed from our sins before we can reside in the presence of a holy God. All right, then inside, now we're inside the sanctuary. We had two rooms. We had the holy place, and then you have the most holy place, right? And in the holy place, we have a seven-branded golden candlestick. And that pointed to Jesus. You remember what that pointed to? Jesus says, I am the what? I am the light of the world. Very good. And then we have the table of showbread. There were 12 loaves of bread there. And it pointed to Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said about himself also? I'm the bread of life, right? So the priest was a symbol of Jesus, right? Because Jesus is our great high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Are you following me so far? So far, so good? All right, good. And then we had the altar of incense, which represented the prayers of the saints, our prayers that are mixed with the righteousness and the beauty of Jesus. And then those, the smoke of those prayers would descend into the most holy place where the presence of God abide there. Then you have the most holy place, and we found the Ark of the Covenant, right? And that was a symbol of what? Do you remember? Of God's what? It was, the presence of God was there, and it was a symbol of God's throne, right? It's the place where the presence of God will literally reside there between the two angels, the cherubims there. So how do I know that? Okay, 
That's what the Bible says. So right there, you see those two things on the side? Those are representation of angels. Look what Exodus 25 says. I will speak with you from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, which are on the ark of the testimony. So it was either called the ark of the covenant or it was called the ark of the testimony. And it represented God's throne in heaven. And if you study what the Bible says about Lucifer, you discover something very interesting. I don't know if you know this, but Ezekiel 28 says that Lucifer was a covering angel. So he was one of the ones, the two angels, right, in next to the Ark of the Covenant, right? That means that at some point he had a, one of the highest positions in heaven, before the throne of God, okay, the most prominent position. He was a covering angel, and he stood right in next to the throne of God. Can you imagine the fall, how Lucifer had fallen from being in the presence of God? But we're going to cover that at another night. So the sanctuary is one of the most important keys to understanding Revelation. And if you read the book of Revelation carefully, you'll find sanctuary language all over the place. All right, in Revelation 11, John sees the throne of God in vision. Look what he says. Then the temple of God was open in heaven, and the ark of his covenant was seen in his temple. Are you following? That's sanctuary language, okay? And then in Revelation 1, look what it says. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. So what did John see when he was in vision? He saw Jesus among the seven lampstands. Where, did the, where does that put Jesus in the sanctuary? Where did he see Jesus? In which part of the sanctuary? The courtyard, the holy place, or the most holy place? Mm -mm -mm. Very good. All right. And standing where? In the midst of the seven. Um, so let's look at Revelation 5. It says, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders stood what? A lamb as though it had been slain. So Jesus appears in the throne room of heaven, but he doesn't appear as a human being. He's a, a lamb slain, which is also sanctuary language. So now let's look at Revelation 8. Then another angel having a golden censer came and stood where? He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the what? All right. So this is not the altar of sacrifice that's in the courtyard. This is the altar of incense that's right up against the curtain that leads into the most holy place. So again, the smoke would descend up and it will go into the presence of God. It might be the holy place, but its primary function, that altar was again, it was the prayers of the saints and it would go and, and go up and go into the presence of God. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter four. It's describing the second coming, 14. Another angel came out of the what? Crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, thrust in your sickle and reap for the time has come. And it goes on, for you, um, for you to reap for the what? Harvest of the earth is right. Now, now remember a lot of the feasts that we talked about yesterday, right? Israel had to do with what? With, um, with a harvest. So the sanctuary language, the second coming is referred to a harvest. And that language is used when describing the second coming. In 1 Corinthians 15, let me read this to you. It says, Christ is the first fruit, and then the rest of us become part of the harvest at his second coming. So here it says, for you to reap the harvest of the earth. In other words, the second coming of Jesus. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. All right, and then it goes finished. It says, for you, um, did I just read that? Yeah. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So when it's time for the second coming, they make an announcement in heaven. 
So when it's time to come and gather God's people, there's a great announcement in, in heaven that says what? That the harvest is ready. All of this is sanctuary language. This is one of the biggest keys, again, for the book of Revelation, and I cannot overemphasize it. So what is it that I'm trying to get, make sure that you understand? That in order for us to understand the book of Revelation, we need to understand the what? <laughs> the sanctuary. Okay? All right, there's a sanctuary in heaven, my friends. The earthly sanctuary was the one that humans built, right? It was a pattern after the real sanctuary that God built in heaven. We saw it last night from the book of Hebrews, right? That Moses was given the pattern, right? A pattern after what? It was a sanctuary motif, but it was from what? The heavenly sanctuary. Look what the prophet Isaiah also says. It says, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the what? Okay, so where's God's throne? It's in the temple, <laughs> all right? This is easily one of the most dominant themes in the Bible. Now, last night, we studied the sanctuary furniture and the, and the sanctuary itself and its furniture, but we also looked at feasts. Do you remember how many feasts we looked at? We looked at seven feasts, and they happened every year. We're still on review. So there were seven special feasts held each year. And what does seven represent in prophecy in the Bible? Perfection and completion. So there were seven feasts that showed up, that showed, those seven feasts show the complete ministry of Jesus for the church. Right, the whole year provided to um, provided to be prophecy of Jesus' ministry from the day he died on the cross to his second coming. So those seven feasts were going to give them an illustration of the ministry of Jesus from the cross all the way to his second coming. So let's look at the the seven feasts here. There was you you had the Passover where a lamb was slain, remember, and then that blood was put on the doorposts. All right, of the house in order to prevent the angel of death from coming upon that house. And it was pr a prediction of what? Of the cross where Jesus is the Lamb of God, of God who died um, to save us from the wages of sin. So that was the parallel there. And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread where all the leaven was removed from the house. And that symbolized what? The removal of sin in our lives. Okay? All right, then on the third day, you had the priest would wave a, a sheaf of grain, right, as an act of faith, saying what? That here's the first part of this harvest, but by faith we believe that the rest of the harvest is going to come also. So it pointed us to the three days when Jesus rose from the dead, and he became the first fruit of them who slept. Are you following me so far? Okay, and it guarantees us that even if we shall die, we know that we will come again and be resurrected with Jesus. All right, so then you have the Feast of Pentecost, which pointed to the day when Jesus launched his New Testament church, and it actually happened on the very day of Pentecost. Then you have a long break over the summer, which kind of synced with the Dark Ages. You have this long gap in between, between the summer and the fall, right? And then you have three more feasts. The Feast of Tabernacles, which was a solemn warning. Uh, no, the Feast of Trumpets, right? Which was a solemn warning that you had 10 days to make things right with God. Because the next feast was going to be the Day of Atonement, right? The most solemn day of the year. If you didn't make things right with God in those 10 days, you were literally cut off from the people of God forever. And then the last feast was the Feast of Tabernacles, when the people would go camping. That's what they did. <laughs> they would go camping, and, it was, and they would live in these, these booths, right, and, um, which were made out of branches. And it was a celebration that what? that uh, of their time in the wilderness that was over and now they were in the promised land, <laughs> okay? So now, and they were celebrating the fact that the promise that one day, because we're pilgrims in this earth, amen, that one day we're going to be home with Jesus, 
all right? And all of that pointed to the second coming when God would literally, when he comes, we're going to tabernacle with God. We're going to live with him, all right? And that's where we left off last night. Whew, that took a while. I, I was rushing through that, but, but you get it? Did you get it a little bit more clearer tonight? Okay, good. All right, but then now, then after that, we slow down, right, and we examine the Day of Atonement. So some, some people call it, do you remember what's another day for a Day of, of, of Atonement? Yom Kippur. Ten days earlier, they blew the trumpets at the warning, and then they had ten days to make things right, and the Bible says that everybody was supposed to search their hearts, okay? The ten day of atonement was the day, the day of atonement was the day of judgment. Look what Leviticus 23, 29 says. For any person who is not, who is not afflicted in soul on that day, shall be cut off from his people. So everything, everything absolutely had to be right with God. Otherwise, what would happen? You would be removed from among God's people. This was the final chance. Are you hearing me? This was the final chance. And during the Day of the Atonement, they had a very special ritual to clean the temple, a ceremony that you're going to find in Leviticus 16. Look what it says. Then he saw he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting. So why would the sanctuary need to be atoned? Why would the sanctuary need to be? It's people who need atonement, not buildings, right? Okay? Except that all year long, the sins of Israel were symbolically, right, transferred into the sanctuary. Every time they came with a lamb, right, they would confess, they were sacrificed, and then the lamb would die, and then that blood was carried into the tabernacle. That was all done, right, as a symbol of Christ. It was symbolic of why Jesus was taking the sins from us onto himself. Okay? But that meant that symbolically all the sanctuaries were, all the sins were in the sanctuary in the presence of God. So once a year they cleansed the building itself. It was the most solemn day of the year and two goats were chosen. One was called the Lord's goat and it was sacrificed and then the blood was carried into the sanctuary and that was a symbol of Jesus. The high priest was also a symbol of Jesus, and he alone can go into the most holy place. What was in the most holy place? Do you remember? The The Ark of the Covenant, the throne of God, the presence of God literally resided in in that area. And then he would sprinkle the blood, the high priest now, on the lid of the, of the ark, which is also called the mercy seat. And this was a solemn occasion. If everything wasn't exactly right, the high priest who went into the holy place, he would drop dead. Do you believe that? It was such a solemn thing that the high priest once a year went in there and they, and they actually would put a, a rope on him and they would put bells so that they can hear him in there. And if those bells weren't ring, ringing, what did that mean? That means that he died. And nobody was going to go into the most holy place in the presence of God. So the rope was so they can pull him out of in there. Isn't that something? That's how everything had to be exactly right or he would do- drop dead. So the David Atonement is also ma- mentioned in the book of Hebrew. Look what it says. But into the second part the most holy place, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sin. So the high priest went into the second compartment by himself, right? Once a year, he offered the blood on behalf of the people in the presence of God. And he did this on Yom Kippur, on the day of judgment. And he did it every year until suddenly... At the death of Christ, an unseen hand suddenly ripped that veil in two, exposing the most holy place. So remember, nobody saw that but the high priest. But when Jesus died on the cross, while they were in the sanctuary trying to offer a sacrifice, a lamb, the lamb of God had already died on the cross. 
So the whole veil was ripped into two. Look what it says. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Okay? It was the moment when all those rituals, my friend, in the temple f finally were finished. Why? Because Jesus, because the real lamb had come and had died on the cross. Now that wasn't necessary anymore. Can you imagine the fear that came upon them at that moment? Right. So the real lamb had died in the courtyard of the heavenly sanctuary. He was going back to heaven's sanctuary now to be our great priest. Now, and this is important, right? Because sometimes we think that the story ends at the cross and then Jesus, that's it. Jesus is not doing anything else. No, he went back to the heavenly sanctuary now to finish his ministry on our behalf. Amen? When Jesus died, we no longer needed the earthly sanctuary. So be careful, my friends, that we're not deceived to look for a sanctuary here on earth to be rebuilt. Right? We no longer needed the symbols because we had the real thing. The whole sanctuary was a symbol. And now that we have the real thing, we don't need the symbol anymore. Now the Lamb of God is our high priest in the real sanctuary, the one in heaven. Are you following me so far? Look what Hebrew says. For Christ has not entered the holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. We have the real lamb and the real sanctuary right now. Now let's go back to our prophecy. Okay? Remember, and, on, and he said to me, for 2,300 days, then the cleansing, the sanctuary shall be cleansed. So let me ask you, when was the sanctuary cleansed? When was the sanctuary cle cleansed? On the day of atonement, Yom Kippur, on the day of judgment. So what is Daniel trying to tell us? This is absolutely amazing, my friend. Gabriel didn't explain this in Daniel chapter 8. But in Daniel chapter 9, he comes back, right? And that's why you always have to read the whole thing. Do you know that how we have chapters and verses in the Bible? You know that that wasn't originally in there. That was man just kind of dividing it so it can be easier. But the scriptures are one continuous story. It doesn't stop in chapters and verses. That was man that put that in there. Daniel um, chapter 9 opens with Daniel praying for understanding. And while he's praying, he suddenly gets a visitor. Who do you think the visitor is that, that comes back to Daniel? The angel Gabriel, the same angel that visited him in the beginning of the story. All right, so look what he says. Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fight swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. In other words, Daniel, I know you didn't get it the first time, so I'm going to tell it to you again. <laughs> Explain it to you this time, right? And for the rest of the chapter, Gabriel explains by giving something known as the 70-week prophecy. So now I need you to hold on to your seatbelts, right? Because now we're about to break that down really quickly, right? Now, before we look at it, let's review two principles again. If you're calculating dates and you go from B.C. to A.D., how, how much do you add to the total? In Bible prophecy, what does a day represent? How many days will there be in a week? <laughs> you almost didn't get that. That was the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now we're going to move very methodically, right? Be right, We're going to let the Bible speak for itself because the 70-week prophecy, sometimes a lot of people talk about it, but most people take it out of context. And remember, that's another principle. We can't take things out of context, right? So let's get started. All right, so it says 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. This is Gabriel talking to Daniel, right? So let me ask you, who are Daniel's people? Who are Daniel's people? The Jews. Very good. And which city would Daniel be uh, talking about? Which city would, would, is Daniel's city? Jerusalem. What Gabriel is saying is very important. Daniel's saying 
Daniel, 70 weeks are determined for your people. So 70 out of that 2,300 prophecy is just regarding your people. So what does the word determine mean? All right, let's look at that. Okay, so the original Hebrew word is, and please forgive me, I don't know Hebrew. I'm going to do the best. I know Spanish and I know English. Hebrew, I don't know, is is chahak. All right, which means set aside. So the terms mean 70 weeks are set aside, cut off from something else, right? He's cutting it off from the 70 weeks from the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, the 2,300 years, right? The vision from the beginning. Daniel's 70 weeks are cut off from that prophecy, and it has to do, that portion of the prophecy has to do with Daniel's people and the sanctuary in Jerusalem, all right? This is very important. Daniel 9 does not stand alone. Gabriel is talking about um, 70 weeks or 490 years, okay? So out of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8. So how many days in a week? A day represents what? So this is 70 weeks, which is 490 days. You get the math? 7 times 70 equals 490, right? I did that really for me because I'm not good at math. All right, and 490 days is how many years? 490 years. Very good. All right. So let's let's put that on a chart. Okay. This is what we know so far. There are 2,300 days in Daniel chapter eight, and there are 490 days in Daniel chapter nine. Those first 490 days are cut off from the larger prophecy. So you see how these 490 days or years are cut off from the big one. That's what we're focusing on, right? And it has to do with Daniel's people and the Jews and the city of Jerusalem, okay? Now, what we don't know is when the prophecy starts, right? But Gabriel is about to explain that to us. Look what he says. He says, now, un- now therefore... Uh, and- now, know and therefore, no, wait a minute, <laughs> know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, that's it, we're going to get the starting date, to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be six, seven weeks and 62 weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous time. So seven weeks plus 62 weeks equals 69 weeks, right? All right. So Daniel, after 69 weeks, the Messiah is going to come. Listen, the first coming of Jesus came right on schedule, (laughs) right on schedule. Again, that's seven weeks plus 62 weeks equals 69. And when does that begin? When the decree to rebuild Jerusalem comes out, all right? Now, remember, we just read this one from the going forth of the rebuilding. All right, so let's continue. All right, so, and that's something we know for sure, right? Under the Persians, there were several, um, there were actually several decrees. Now, you got to remember, um, um, Daniel is... It's still in media Persia, but they were captives. Remember, the Jews were captive. Nebuchadnezzar had destroyed the temple and the city, and, and now the decree is going to go that they can go back and rebuild, right? And this happened in 457 BC under the king, a king named Arthaxerxes. So even though there were several decrees to go back and rebuild, this is the decree that they finally went back and rebuild, and that happened in 4. Um, 457 BC. Not only did they they go back, but they actually um, the king financed that mission trip so they can go back and 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 rebuild the city and the and the temple. So you can read that in um, in Ezra chapter seven, okay? And it gives us the starting point of 457. So let's put that on the chart. So it starts at 457, right? Gabriel says that there will be 49, 69 weeks until the Messiah Prince, which is 483 years, okay? Remember, a day is for a year, and of course, you add one to the total, so it brings us at, um, um, so wait, and this, you add one to the total when you cross the B.C. and A.D. line, so that takes us to 27 A.D. Now, 27 A.D., um, happens to be the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. So does anyone know what happened in 27 AD? 
Does anyone know what happened in 27 AD? Anyone? Right. What happened there? It's the baptism of Jesus, Brother Eddie. Very good. The baptism of E. So according to Luke chapter 3, that happened on the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. And on that occasion, the heavens opened, remember, and God announced his, the beginning of his son's ministry. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Have you ever wondered why Jesus um, spent so many years in obscurity? You know, just he was, he was not... So do you, do you understand why? Because according to Daniel chapter 9, the time had not come for him to start his earthly ministry yet. Everything was prophetically on a time clock, and Jesus knew, right? Isn't this incredible? <laughs> All right, so I'm going to keep on going here quickly. So we have 69 weeks until Messiah makes his public appearance, and, but the whole prophecy is 70 weeks, remember? Which takes us to 34 A.D., and does anyone know what happened in 34 AD? Does anyone remember what happened in 34 AD? Do you remember? It was in 34 AD, it was the stoning of Stephen. Okay? And from that point on, right, it was the last appeal for the Jews to accept the Messiah. And they rejected him and they stoned Stephen. Okay? So, so that was the beginning of the great persecution and spearheaded none other than, remember Saul of Taurus, of Tarsus? He became Paul the apostle, right? So the Bible says that persecution scattered all of the believers everywhere, which means that the gospel now was carried to the Gentiles. The, the gospel was carried to everyone, right? The gospel goes to the Gentile. In other words, Jesus says in Matthew 21, the vineyard is rented out to someone else. He says the kingdom of God will be given to a nation bearing much fruit. In, in 34 AD, 70 weeks are over, okay? The special period of time set, a time set aside for Daniel, you know, and his people to finish and to carry out the gospel had come. In other words, their probation time was over, right? And now according to the Bible, that means that every one of us now can be Israelites, right, by faith. You know, look what Paul writes. He says, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Amen? So we're all spiritual Jews now, Israelites, right? And heirs according to the promise. The promise is now for all of us. We're all descendants of the Jewish uh, of the Jews. So listen to what Paul says here. For he is not a Jew who is, who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one what? Inwardly, and circumcision is that of the what? Is after heart. Now, I want, it, um, I, want to, I want to be clear here and pause for a second. The people of Israel, the Jews, will always have a special place in God's heart. Amen? Right? But now there's a sharp distinguish now between Jews and, and that, 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 that distinguish. The, what's the word I'm looking for? That, that um, distinction between Jew and Gentile is not there anymore. They were raised for a purpose. They failed that purpose. Now all of us, okay? Because it was supposed to go to the Gentiles from the beginning, but they failed to do that. And honestly, um, it, it was never supposed to be different. They were supposed to take it to the Gentile. All right, so, they, um, let, so now we get grafted into the tree. All right, listen to what the Bible says. It says, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. Amen? For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon his name. Amen. The time was up. The 70 weeks or the 400 years for Daniel's people were done. So the stoning of Stephen is the marker where now the gospel goes to all the world. And that happened in 34 A.D. All right, so we've got the decree at 457, right? We got the baptism of Jesus, right? The appearance of the Messiah right on schedule in 27 AD and the close of time set aside for Daniel's people to 34 AD. And that would be amazing enough. If I said goodnight to you tonight, that would be enough, <laughs> but I'm not, 
right? We still got to finish, <laughs> right? At some point, look what it says. And after the 62 weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself and the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. So at some point after the 62 weeks, which are part of the 69 weeks, right? Messiah will be cut off for other people. So when was the Messiah cut off? When was the Messiah cut off? At the cross. Very good, Marie. And that did happen after the baptism, right? All right. So then Gabriel says that someone would come and destroy the temple again. And of course, that happened too in what year? Do you remember what year the temple was destroyed? Remember we did Saturday, Matthew 24? And, and, and in 70 AD, the Romans came, Titus, and they destroyed the temple, right? So you've got the death of Christ, and then you have the destruction of Jerusalem again. So let's put that on the chart too. All right, so somewhere in between 27 AD and 34 AD, Jesus would be crucified. All right, so, and we know that that happened before 34 AD, which was the stoning of Stephen, okay? So this is very specific, but it gets even more specific. All right, let me ask you, how much time elapsed between 27 AD and 34 AD? How much time is that? Seven years, right? So you have the 69 weeks, but another week, and that will complete the seven weeks, right? So... Let's look at um, what it says here. Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week, but in the middle of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and to offerings. All right. So let me ask you, who put an end to the sacrificial system? It was Jesus. They no longer needed the sacrifices because the real lamb had come and died on the cross. So the hand of God rips the veil in two. This is clearly prophesied about Jesus. This is a prophecy about Jesus. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is because there are some modern books that you read now and they try to say that this is a prophecy about the Antichrist. Okay? But read the ninth chapter of Daniel and very carefully. And it's obvious that this is talking about Jesus the prince. He says that he's the one that's cut off. This is a prophecy about Jesus Christ, and it's not a prophecy about the Antichrist. But honestly, it's only been in the last 150 years that some people have tried to make this about somebody else than Jesus. Okay, this is clearly about the Messiah, and it says that in the middle of the week, between his baptism, right, and the stoning of, Se of Stephen, what happened? Jesus dies. Okay, so let's put that on the chart. So it starts in 457, the baptism of Jesus, 27 AD. Three and a half years later, in the middle of that week, he's crucified. And then the prophecy of the 70 weeks ends in 34 AD, right? Which has to do with the people of Israel and the sanctuary. And all of this happened on time. There's no doubt that it's talking about um, Jesus, and all of this was prophesied in the book of Daniel 500 years before Jesus came, okay? So there is no question that the Bible is not a human document. It's, an inspired, it's inspired by God. Now, let me slow down and address something for you just for, for, for clarity. In recent years, right, some people have taken this last week and they've, of the 70 weeks, and they've put it all away in, in the future, They've removed it from the other 69 weeks. And they say that this happens down at the end of time. They say that it represents the final seven last years of Earth's history. Are you following me? They say, no, no, this last week has to do with the last, um, um, it's suggesting that it has to do with the last seven years of, of Earth's history. And there's nothing in this prophecy that suggests that. So, does it make sense that the seventh the if week comes after the 69th week? Does it make sense? It's like if I say to you, okay, listen, um, it's about 70 um, miles to my house. You're all invited to my house, okay? It's about 70 miles, and it's going to take you about four hours, right? 
and then you're driving about four or five hours, right? And you realize that, you know, you can't find the exit to my house, right? And then you call me and say, Lillian, I thought you said that this was only 70 miles, you know? And I go, oh, I forgot to tell you that you're going to travel 69 miles, and then when you get to the last mile to my house, it's going to be about 2,000 miles in between there. <laughs> between, <laughs> does that make sense? Absolutely not. So the 70th week comes after the 69th week. Now let's finish the prophecy because some people don't, they keep thinking that this has to do with the Antichrist. So let's see what Gabriel says, all right? And on the wing of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. Now let me ask you, after Jesus died, what was left desolate? After Jesus dies, do you remember what was left desolate to them? The temple. Remember? It had all ended. Remember Jesus says, behold, your house is left to you desolate. Because no longer this, they had rejected Jesus. Those sacrifices meant nothing anymore because the true one died on the cross, right? And Rome came in, in, in the year 70 AD and burned the temple down, Okay. So what do we have in Daniel chapter 9 is actually a parallel. It gives the same idea twice. So let me just read it. So you have the Messiah is cut off and then the prince who destroys the temple, right? And then you have Messiah ends the sacrifice and one who makes the, the temple desolate. And remember, it was Titus who, who um, destroyed the temple, okay? All right, so it says the same thing twice. All right, so there's a need. Um, so we don't need to chop off this prophecy and cut off that last week and move it someplace else because it doesn't fit where, where, it's, where it's in its context. All right, so let's go back to our chart. The 70 weeks starts in 457 B.C., right? 69 weeks later, or 483 years, it is announced that Jesus, the Messiah, will start his ministry. Then you have one last week, but in the middle of that week, three and a half years, Jesus only had a ministry of three and a half years. He was crucified, so that meant that, remember when Jesus told the disciples, don't go to the Gentiles, go, but go back to the house of Israel first, because he knew they only had three and a half more years of probation before they would be cut off as his people, right? And then the stoning of Stephen comes, right? And then what happens? Now the gospel goes out to all the world. All right, so it says that the Messiah brings an end to the sacrifice in the middle of the week, and he's cut off. And Gabriel says that this prophecy, the 70 weeks, is lifted out of which prophecy? Which time frame? The 490 years is cut off from which longer prophecy? The 2,300 day. So he just solved the puzzle for us, right? So here it is. The 2,300 years also begin in 470, 457, right? Because it has the same beginning date, right? And, um, and, then, and if you remember to add one, right, that takes us all the way down to 1844. So from the, the, the entire prophecy of the 2,300 days begins in 457, and it ends in 1844 after the Dark Ages. Do you realize what this means? Are you getting what this means? What, what would happen after the 2,300 year, um, years? It says, then the sanctuary will be cleansed, right? And what is that, that means? The sanctuary will be cleansed? Judgment. So the spring festivals pointed to the earthly ministry of Jesus, and after a long break, the fall festivals pointed to the end. So after 2,300 days, the sanctuary would be cleansed. Are you following me? I'm going to go real slow. It's not the second coming of Christ, but it's the beginning of the time of the end. Remember, this is called the time of the end, right? So the, the beginning of the time of the end. It's the heavenly Yom Kippur, the hour of judgment, right? That means that the books are already open now. Remember, I left you yesterday. With, don't you want to know when this judgment begins? Are you with me? The books are open. The scene of Daniel chapter 7, remember we, we saw a scene there of the judgment is taking place right now. Let's read it. 
I beheld till the thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like the pure wool. His throne was like the, like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. A fiery stream issuing came forth from before him. Thousands, thousand ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. And the what? Judgment was sent, and what happened? And the books were open. At some point before Jesus comes, the judgment begins. And when the judgment is over, Jesus receives his kingdom. The next event in Daniel chapter 7, right, is this, ju is, is this judgment. Look what it says. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given to him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not be passed away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. The moment is coming when the stone will smash the statue, remember? And all the kingdoms of men will pass away. That's Daniel chapter 2. The moment is coming when Jesus will establish his kingdom, and that kingdom is going to last forever. And he does it the moment the judgment is over. So before Jesus comes, the judgment will be finished, and the judgment is taking place right now. Okay? Do you realize that where we are right now? Absolutely. Because remember what we talked about yesterday? Jesus is the judge and he's the lawyer. How can we win? How can we lose this case? Right? He's both, right? So we're just about there, my friends, okay? The history of this planet is about to be finished. The judgment hour is on its way right now. And when it's finished, history is over, okay? And when Jesus comes, the decisions are made. Look what Revelation 22 says. And behold, I come quickly, and my what? Is with me to give every man according to his work shall be, right? So let me ask you, how can Jesus come to, with his rewards unless what? The judgment is over. Every case has already been decided, right? Um, the judgment is finished, and just before he returns, when he comes, he's coming to give his reward. At the same moment, the world will know. There's gonna, now, let me ask you, what are the rewards that Jesus is coming to give? What are the rewards? Eternal life for those who believe? or eternal condemnation to those who don't believe. But before he can bring those rewards, there had to be a process to determine who. And that's the judgment that we're experiencing right now. We're living in the time of, of the judgment right now, in the, in the most solemn time. So what were they to do when, they, when the time of judgment? They were to afflict their hearts. They were, they were to say, am I close to Jesus? Is there something in my life that keeps me from Jesus, right? But you know, the Bible doesn't end there. It says, and give me two more minutes, guys. It, the Bible says that there will be a message that will be given to the, la to the people in the end dying to warn them that the judgment has begun. And look what it is in Revelations 14. We've read it already. It says, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindreds and tongue and people. This is a global message that is to be given, saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. <laughs> it's come right now. So listen, my friend, it's true. This is really true, <laughs> okay? The time of the end, right now, you and I are living in the time of the end. So it's not because we watch the news and we say, yep, it's, it's the time of the end. It's because as we study these prophecies, we know that the next great event that's coming is what? The kingdom of God. Jesus is the ne next great event. And listen, everything that we have read was already predicted, has already happened. Everything, right? We're like a heartbeat away from the coming of Jesus. 
How, does, how do you feel about that? Jesus came the first time on time, and he's going to come the second time on time. Right? The sanctuary showed us all those details, right? Because God is going to put an end to human suffering soon. One amen on this side. God is going to put an end to human suffering forever. And the, I want you to leave here with one thing. The judgment is good news, right? Because remember, the judgment is, is, is to acquit us, not to condemn us. John wants us to know, God wants us to know that he wants to not keep you out of heaven. He's trying to get you into heaven. Amen? So the question is, where are you with Jesus tonight? What have you done with Jesus, the salvation that Jesus is offering you? Right? What did you do? What have you done with this great gift? And I pray to God, my friends, listen, I know we went quickly and we took five minutes extra today, so forgive me. But I wanted to make sure you left here. That all of this, the timeline is perfect. God loves you. God wants you to know this. God wants you to be ready for his kingdom. Right? And tonight, let me tell you, just this is the appeal. If you want Jesus to represent you in that judgment, right, raise your hand. <laughs> Lord Jesus, I want you to represent me in that judgment. And if Jesus represents us in that judgment, we don't have to fear because this case we're going to win. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Let's pray together. Loving Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, so much for allowing us to just Look at your word tonight. It is clear that you love it. It's clear that the details are overwhelming in your word that tells us exactly how soon you are. Father, we're not, we don't predict a time or an hour because you told us that we're not to do that. But you've given us everything that you need so that we can be ready. So that we can set aside those things in our life that separate us from you. And that we can surrender our heart to you, that, Lord, you can represent us. So bless us now, Lord, and help us to leave here knowing that you love us, Lord, and that the judgment is good news that's taking place right now, and that we can share that with others. Bless us, Father, in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen.